So yeah, since I did my PhD here, uh, I've been researching the phenomenon of crisis at the individual level, because of course we can refer to crisis at national or global levels, but individual crisis I've been studying um, now for, for, for 10 years or a little bit more. And that's led to a series of journal articles and, uh, and also a book in which it, that, that topic features heavily. Um, and this material is going to make, is, is the substance of what today's talk is. It's all, all the facts and figures that I mention are drawn from this series of articles that have been written uh, over the past 10 years on the topic. Um, and uh, yes, Development Through Adulthood is the, is the book that I've written, which summarizes uh, my research and integrates it with others as well. And it turns out that this work is of particular interest to the media. So a, a substantial part of my job, as it's pa panned out, has been speaking to the media about my work and interpreting it for the general public and producing work that is uh, for uh, the non-specialist and, uh, and doing interviews and so on and so forth, whether that was with The New Scientist or uh, which one was that? Um, oh, that was more recently with First Direct. There's, you can see this is actually a newspaper from India and China that have covered the research, so it has global interest. And this was... Um, a piece on the Times on my work on later life crisis. So there's something about the topic that has wide-ranging general interest. I think it's a topic that's easy to grasp, that has popular resonance, and that many people can relate to. So the questions that I'm going to address today are, what is a developmental crisis episode? What does it mean to go through one? What do we mean by human potential, seeing as that's the topic of today, and what does it mean to release that? When and how often do crisis episodes happen in adulthood? And does the nature and content of crisis differ by age group? So is it a fundamentally different thing to have a crisis when you're 60 than when you're 16? What kinds of things do people experience in a developmental crisis? And uh, what is the function of crisis in development? Why do we have them? And what are they for? Or if indeed, is, that, is there a substantive answer to that question? Are they for anything? Now, something I want to say now, before we get cracking, is that I've got some interactive activities that we'll do via a system called Mentimeter. And to get onto that, you need A, to be on Wi-Fi or to have access to mobile data. So you might want to just check that your reception's all right on your mobile phone. Um, and when it, when it comes round to these activities, you need to go on www.menti.com and then put in a code and then answer questions that I'll put to you as a group. So that will happen on, I think, four occasions during the talk while I'll ask you for information uh, to see about your experiences or lack thereof. So start off with the first question. What is a de de developmental crisis episode? So the answer that I'm going to give you is based on 10 years of work, interviews, uh, observation, surveys, uh, online written vignettes that people have given me, and more. So uh, it's an episode of life that typically lasts at least a year, which contains the following characteristics. It's felt to be a turning point and or a time of important transition. It's a time of instability and disintegration. You, uh, the feeling is of being fragmented and of being a little all over the place rather than together and singular. You feel a little bit plural, almost like there are parts of you in competition. Feelings of being overwhelmed and struggling to cope using current coping strategies. Struggles with negative emotion and distress. And crucially, uh, is, is a period of intensive questioning of yourself, your situation and what life means. So whereas in some parts of life you may feel that you have all the answers in times of crisis, you certainly don't. It's questions that seem to be prominent in your cognitions. And finally, crucially, a crisis is temporary. It resolves with time. It is not a chronic time delimited or unlimited condition. Um, but challengingly, you only know that it's resolved when it has resolved. And when you're in the middle of it, you don't have necessarily, unless you know a lot about crisis episodes and can recognize the experiences that you're having, that it will end in time. Uh, but that, I find, is something that is an, an, an important aspect of my work, is that a lot of people who do have crisis episodes in their life 
who have read my work have said that it's given them confidence that there's a way through it, that there's a path, a way of navigating from the beginning to the end, and that there is a conclusion in sight. So crisis episodes exist in time, but in two ways. And I've, a neat way of kind of capturing this is using the two words that the ancient Greeks, and probably current Greeks, but certainly the ancient Greeks, used to refer to time, which is kairos and chronos. And chronos is simply the fact that uh, chronos refers to time as it happens chronologically as according to your watch, that it, has, that it is an, an sort of an objective fact, that it has a beginning and an end, and that it wasn't there before the beginning and seems to have gone by the end. So that it has this clock element. But kairos refers to the experience of time in that a crisis episode is something that you experience as a window of time, as, an, as a period of your life that you chunk together, despite the fact there'll be lots of things going on in it, lots of things going on before and afterwards, that you kind of create it as an episode, you, you plot it together so that it comes to be a, a, a piece of your life, a chapter, something that has a meaningful uh, quality within the story of your life as a whole. And that is, that is Kairos. It's time as told by you. It's time as experienced. Another thing I just want to mention, uh, because it kind of captures the essence of crisis quite neatly, some of you may know this because it has a, a sort of, there's a popular uh, uh, knowledge element to this now, which is that the, the Chinese symbol for crisis is two symbols, uh, which is uh, the former uh, means in English danger, and the second one means opportunity. And that captures the two sides of crisis quite neatly, that it is a time of vulnerability and of danger, but it is a time of immense opportunity for personal growth. Two, so well done the Chinese for getting that. So neatly wrapped up in two symbols. Now, although I'm not going to be dwelling on this a huge amount over the talk, it's worth just pondering on how this relates to issues of mental illness and mental health problems, because... When we refer to a crisis episode, we refer to experiences that are meaningful within the context of one's life experiences, proportionate, usually, to the, to the intensity of your life experiences and what you're going through, and that is, that is temporary and developmental in that it, there is a process of change that's being undergone. So it is a different way of referring to experience of distress in life from the more clinical categories that, that the health service uses, or indeed some aspects of psychology and psychiatry use, where you give the same label to someone if they show a set of symptoms, no matter what age they are, and relatively irrespective of what they're going through. Um, most the, uh, the biomedical approach to mental illness generally sh takes it out of context and looks at it in a kind of checklist way that, uh, that decontextualizes it. And that can be very helpful in the sense it can po point to things that don't relate to development in any meaningful sense and don't seem to be progressing in something which is about passing through a challenging episode in your life. So, uh, uh, so I will say that, that, that this approach to exploring what it means to be distressed, what it means to feel fragmented, what it means to be going through difficulties, is a more dynamic way of, uh, of, of looking at it, uh, of one which very much looks at it as uh, something which is fun essentially inevitable to, to life's journey and quite helpful uh, and functional. Uh, but it's by no means mutually exclusive to the, to the medical approach, which has its requirements and needs and benefits and can point to chronic conditions that uh, do need a partic particular forms of treatment. So I just want to say that it's, it's a different rubric uh, and a helpful one, I, I find, for many people. So what do we mean by human potential, which, well, and specifically in relation to the stuff that I'm talking about today in terms of crisis? Uh, it refers to that... So I'm just going to shut the door. Got a bit of background noise here. So human potential refers to the hazy future realm between the certain and the impossible. Everything that a person could possibly become in the future that they are not currently. And I just wanted to flag the point that this has implications for, uh, for, for, for ideas of free will. Because if something is possible but not definite, and you can make active attempts to make it more likely, then it's, then it's by no means... Uh, uh, then that very s simple statement is a statement that the future is not, in a, in a sense, predefined or set in stone or determined, and that uh, actions that we can take can uh, 
alter how the future pans out for us and for others. But how do we then, oh, and, and just as a caveat before I go into my next slide, it's really important to point not to sugarcoat this and to, import, uh, and to point out that humans can potentially become many things from the terrible to the terrific. Hence, the idea of human potential contains good and bad possibilities. And to refer to the release of human potential, you have to accept that you're referring to the release of both potentially base potentials as well as uh, higher potentials as well. And therefore, it's particularly important to be conscious about how you try and release your potential because you can quite unconsciously release uh, negative potentials just by incrementally changing in, uh, in, in ways that aren't in your best interest. So ways of consciously releasing potential. Again, this is, uh, what I'm going to be saying here is fairly uh, uh, um, straightforward. I'm not going to be saying anything revolutionary at this point, but just help to sort of scope the territory. So how do you make something that's remotely possible become a realistic and tangible possibility and even an actuality? Well, it's simply by doing things, to, uh, enacting changes that help to bring them about. And one thing you can't do if you want to release potential is stay the same. It just doesn't work. So we have to just scrap that from the outset. Now, I'm not saying there's no merit in staying the same in life. Sometimes continuity has enormous benefits, but it doesn't release potential. It simply keeps you where you are and keeps the possible in that hazy future realm of don't know. Um, and so the kind of things that I encounter in people in crisis as they try and release potential are various forms of personal development, from therapy to coaching to group-based activities, where there are, they're enacting strategies and exploring aspects of themselves that try and move them forward as an adult, to try and push them towards some concept of maturity or wisdom that they feel is important to them. Learn something new. Perhaps come to the weekend university. Uh, try something new, which is a bit different from learning something new. You can uh, you know, have, have uh, uh, new life experiences which aren't so much about learning, but more about the experience themselves, which can uh, inspire uh, or, uh, uh, or, or release potential that, uh, that is contained in, the, in that the experience may stimulate a new direction for you. Alter states of consciousness. Uh, and, and this is something which is, is important and, of course, is varied because you can alter your state of consciousness in a variety of ways. Uh, but I, I, I'm sure that the increasing popularity of techniques such as meditation and mindfulness, for sure, but things like ecstatic dance and psychedelics used in constructive developmental ways, uh, I, I, I've seen as catalysts within personal crisis. By altering your state of consciousness, you, you, you fundamentally alter not just yourself, but how you see the world in ways that can unlock possibilities you didn't previously see. Uh, simply just changing your environment can change your life. Many people do change jobs, change relationships, change country, change a whole host of other things that defines their situ, their situation, their environment, and that can be an important way of actualizing a new aspect of potential. And giving something up can be crucial too. If you feel like that you've developed a habit that's actually playing to your lower potential and you need to give it up in order to explore others, sometimes to gain something, you have to be ready to give something up. Now, all of these can be part and parcel of the experimentation that is the substance of moving through a crisis proactively. And as I will tell you later on, if you're going to boil how to respond productively to crisis down to one sentence, it's to em embrace change and not, and not resist it. Because if you resist it, then you stay in that red square. You stay the same. And whatever potentials you may have remain latent and they'll never become actual. Right, let's have a look at some data now. How often do crisis episodes happen? Are they frequent or infrequent? So I did a survey where I got a pretty nationally representative sample. We actually went to substantial trouble to make sure it was because when you're getting prevalence rates and if you get it from your convenient sample of your mates down the road and then you try and make a strong assertion about the percentage of people going through something, it doesn't really mean a whole lot. So, so we use a, a, a professional recruitment company to get a national sample of people who are stratified by age, as you can see there, and gender, uh, from all around the country. Admittedly, London South East had, had a lot, but we had them from all around the country. We actually had a, a, a naturally representative ethnicity breakdown. The UK is 87% white British, nowhere near that in London, obviously, but this is um, representative of the UK as a whole. And a very varied qualification level as well. So this is by no means a chattering classes sample. It's not people who've gone to university and have just thought too much about life and got, <laughs> got in a muddle. Um, we, you know, we, we, it, was a, it, was, it was, again, very representative of the UK in terms of education. 
And we ask them a very straightforward question based on uh, my definition of crisis, which is this. A crisis is a, uh, an episode is a period in adult life that is noticeably more difficult, stressful, and unstable than normal, during which you sometimes struggle to cope. A crisis is also an important turning point in your life due to challenging changes that occur during it. They typically last for a year or two, but maybe shorter or longer. Would you say that you are currently experiencing a crisis episode in your life? And we gave three options, which is uh, yes, maybe, and no. And uh, so what I'm going to give you is just the, whole, the sample as a whole, just as an aggregate, uh, but broken down into three age groups, younger adults, midlifers, and older adults. And we'll just have a quick look. Is that? Oh, that's, yep, good, that's a laser. So quarter life is people in their 20s and 30s, midlife 40s and 50s, and later life 60s and above. And we'll see what we get. So yes, definitely. 22% of people in their 20s and 30s, 24% of midlifers, and 14% of later lifers. Which is interesting. Because again, if you, if you take that you know, across a large sample, that's a lot of people. But the maybes are interesting too. Because we've got around 30%, 30-ish percent, percent of people saying maybe in all three age groups. So maybe 36% of people of young adults, 36% of midlifers, and 31% of later lifers. So crucially, for those under the age of 60, that leaves a minority of people at any one time sure that they're not having a major personal crisis. Under 50%, so 40 2% of quarter-lifers, 40% of midlifers. It just about creeps over 50% for later-lifers, but it's still by no means uh, a, uh, a positive picture. So I think this is important, because when I started out in my research 10 years ago, I had this picture of life that was what one might call punctuated equilibrium, that life was broadly about long, stable patches with short transitions of crisis in between the two, um, which, which shows up in a very, bunch of biological systems where you get these long periods of stability and then short periods of instability. But no, that's not how life is. Not how adult life is, at least not in the UK, at least not right now. Um, it, really, adult life is much better depicted as a roller coaster where the peaks are as prevalent as the troughs. And that really, you, you know, that if you take a bunch of people, let's say, I don't know, 150 people in a lecture hall at any one time, you'll find a large proportion being either sure or thinking that they are maybe in the, in the middle of a major personal crisis. Or, you know, as I say, one, one that's not about personal hassle, it's not about minor hassles, because the definition is about this is a year or so. This is a big phase of your life. This is not just about waking up in a bad mood. So, I have, uh, I have no idea how this is going to pan out, and I want you to answer honestly, but you're going to tell me anonymously whether you think you're having a crisis at the moment. Uh, and um, so you're going to go to menti.com and use the code 787806, and I'm just going to bring up my menti slide now. You'll see the, the code at the top. We've already got an answer. That was quick. Um, oh, here, here they come in. They're coming in already. So um, we're going to see live results on prevalence of crisis in the room. It's neck and neck at the moment. The maybes are flagging. Very good question. I'm trusting you that you're, you know, that this is completely anonymous. No one has a clue who's clicking what here. There's absolutely no reason for you to click yes, maybe, or no if you don't genuinely feel that. It has no reflection back on you. So I'm hopeful that it's not going to be too biasing of your... Of your. Uh, if, perhaps if, if, if the previous slide was uh, twisting things, maybe would come out on top, because that came out on top in all the previous age groups. Super. Nope, oh, still coming. So obviously this system is completely anonymous, and that's important for some of the later questions where I'll be asking you for more information as well. Um, so the good news and the bad news is all that it's the same thing, really. The good news is the bad news. <laughs> the, the good news is that you're in really good company, yeah? The sick... The 67 of you in the room who have reported that you, yes or maybe, in a crisis, you're an excellent company. You're not weird or unusual. You are not a freak amongst a group of essentially fine people. 
struggling is the norm. And that's, that's the good news as well as the bad news, is that if you, if you kind of release into that a bit and stop putting your pressures on yourself to be perfect all the time, stop believing other people's Facebook feeds, <laughs> then I think that's one step towards, uh, to, towards, towards being okay with what adult development really is, which is a rocky ride. Thank you very much for that. We'll come back to that very shortly. Oh, it's still coming in. <laughs> well, I must say, so I, by the way, obviously this does suggest that compared with my nationally representative sample, that there, that there is a higher prevalence of crisis in this room. But I would absolutely expect that because the act of coming to the weekend university is a classic. <laughs> is a, is a, is, it is a, absolutely what you do when you're having a crisis. It's like, I need to learn stuff that's going to help me get through this. Maybe Dr. Oliver Robinson will tell me something. Who knows? Oh, uh, this was a, just sticking on prevalence for a bit, retrospective appraisal. So this is people who I ask, have you had one in the past? And then, uh, and then ask that of people who are over the age range in question. And you can see that when I asked males and females, with the females being the lighter bar, you can see that actually there, that I got more midlife crisis than quarter-life crisis, with more people reporting it in the 40s than they did in the 30s and 20s, but not by a huge amount. And uh, although women were higher in, uh, in prevalence uh, in all three age groups, that has to be taken with a pinch of salt. That men are generally worse at self-reporting, even to themselves, if they're having a hard time. <laughs> let alone to other people, and we'll, we'll come back to that later on, actually, about, because uh, the, the men in midlife crisis issue, is, it's not that they have more of them, it's just when they do have them, it turns out to be a very significant struggle. Um, and we'll come back to that shortly. All righty, so it's back to you. So we're going to be, what kinds of things are experienced during a crisis? Now, I'm, just, I'm about to challenge you to distill... So 67 of you, or certainly the, you know, any of you who've responded yes or maybe, I'm about to challenge you to distill your crisis down to 140 characters. <laughs> Remember, this is completely anonymous, but I, ask you, I want you to just, just, just describe what's going on in your life. So you're about to see, flooding onto the screen, short depictions of crisis, and yours will be one amongst many. Completely anonymous again, so it's your chance. It might be quite cathartic, just to throw it up there. Go <laughs> Sit on the screen amongst others, and we'll kind of we'll see what kind of things are experienced in crisis. Uh, you know, with, with using you as a live sample. So it's the same code, but don't but just hold hold fire, and I'm just going to go up to the next slide. And then when and then when you reload the page, you will uh, you'll see a text box. Um, now the first two characters, I want your age in numbers, please. Again, this is anonymous, so if you would do that for me, that would be great. So just your age, and then whatever's been going on for you. Now, for those of you who've not had a crisis, can you pick up your mobile phone anyway and just stare into it? <laughs> because then uh, there's no real indication about who's, you know, you could just, I don't know, go on Wikipedia or something, check the football score if you like. Um, whatever, whatever works for you. Now, um, now what, what do we want here? So really, it's like, it's events, it's uh, events that's going on, it's feelings that you've been feeling, you know, what do you... Oh. A bit of feedback for you. Uh, or uh, something that's cryptic, like 36 on Struggle Street, which has already gone up. Remember, you've got 140 characters, so you can extend it out to a sentence. Or just keep it really, really brief.
So what you see on the board does reflect what I'm now going to be telling you about from my own research you know, over the subsequent half an hour or so. Half an hour or so. Uh, you'll see that, it, that crisis has inner and outer quali uh, qualities to it, so people go through very tangible events, changes, but will experience inner changes that often parallel those events as well, which often involve a sense of deep loss as well as a sense of gain, a sense of angst about the future as well as kind of concern about the past, and a whole host of other things. Uh, 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 Self-initiated interventions like hallucinogens we saw on one or CBT or whole, all kinds of other things. Major life events that somehow kind of trip some kind of fragility in a person where they feel that suddenly, you know, what was, uh, what was previously stable is instable and so on. But a whole host of events, parenthood, children growing up, retirement, not having work, having too much work, health problems and a whole host of other things. Now, I just want us to just to pause and digest this for a second, because the fact of the matter is that the vast majority of the time, the material on that board doesn't get discussed with many people at all. And we do our best to project a, 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 a vision of ourselves to other people where there aren't flaws and there aren't problems and there aren't all the things that are moving across our screen right now. And that's the way that life works. We'll refer to come back to that in a minute. Uh, but I, I think that there's scope for finding better ways of, of discussing this and, and, and uh, in ways where, where we understand that distress needn't be a sign of something that is biologically wrong with us, but a sign uh, uh, that it's, it's time to change and that there is simply no better incentive to change than feeling bad. It's the, the ultimate motive to move out of your current situation. Uh, right, quarter-life crisis. Now, quarter-life crisis is a term I didn't initially use to, to refer to crisis in young adults. I ref just originally referred to early adult crisis, but I noticed that some popular works have been written on, people, on, on young adults, particularly in their mid to late 20s, having a quarter-life crisis. These were some of them. And so I, I thought, well, I'll, I'll, I'll use the popular term to try and create some popular resonance with my own work. And that was when uh, my work then became very popular. The, on, on this topic, develop popular interest. So it kind of worked. Now, I'm just going to throw you some, initially, some uh, from a big, the same, in fact, this is the same big survey of 1,000 plus people in the UK, and I ask, you know, what's the most prevalent feature of your crisis? These were the things that came up in young men and women as the most prevalent. Now, slightly back, back to front on this slide, and that the most prevalence at the bottom of the table for the men and for the women, uh, and then moving up, so it's like the, the top 10-ish, for men and women, the, of the most prevalent features. So you can see the number one for men is feeling trapped in a job you don't want to be in anymore. That's ahead of unemployment, which is quite important. That actually it's being in a job you don't want to be in is for slightly more people a problem than not having one at all. Stress and pressure in job obviously is there. So the top three for men are in crisis. Relationship issues to come up to the top, whereas for men the work stuff tends to come up to the top. But in the end, the picture looks similar for men and women. It's just the prevalence of those items is slightly different. So what you can, the picture on the, on the board there is of young people struggling to find their place in a set of commitments that work for them. Struggling to make that move from feeling free to feeling settled down, to, to feeling like you've put down roots and you're sure those roots are in the right place. And, and that's the ultimate challenge of quarter life crisis. And for some people, it's not being able to get the roots down at all. For some people, it's putting them down and then going, uh oh, that's, I'm now very much here, but I want to be over there. And I would suggest to you that I think that, that young people making the right choices first time is unusual. That once people come out of the education system, it's the norm to mess up something quite dramatically at least once, mm -hmm. whether that's a relationship or a career or both, or, or other things. You know, there's lots to mess up in life. Now, um, so what I what, what I came out with in my research was a sort of broad typology of two fundamental kinds of quarter life crisis, which I call the locked in and locked out crisis. Oh, just before I get on to that, a recent study by LinkedIn on quarter life crisis found out that the peak age, they found that the peak age for this was 26.9. <laughs> so they get quite precise. So, uh, but I, I also found that there's something around that kind of 27, 28 age range, which is important. That has personal resonance for me, because I had a really fruity quarter life crisis between the ages of 27 and 28, probably on for a bit longer as well. Uh, and my life changed radically in almost every way during that time. I was a, a very dull market research executive beforehand 
and I became a slightly less dull PhD student afterwards. So uh, certainly kind of started me off. Yeah, it starts, change, change, but that was you know, one part of a very complicated episode. I'll happily, happily talk to you about it later. <laughs> there were, there were you know, an awful lot of dynamics going on. It was a kind of a, a sort of a implosion and, and then rebirth of, of me to a degree. Uh, so 6,000 respondents, yet yeah, 26 to 27 was the peak age according to LinkedIn. Um, so uh, here's my two kinds. There's the locked out crisis, which uh, typically starts with people feeling that they're unable to enter some desired adult commitments in relationship and career, a loss of self-esteem, feelings of unwanted dependence on others, feelings of isolation, and you know, the, the, the kind of looking, for the, un, the, the young person unemployed trying to break into all the things that they see that are potentially out there for them by way of money and status and all the things that other people seem to have and not being able to get that. That's the essence of a locked out crisis and really that resolves by breaking in to uh, uh, what's perceived to be valued social roles, whether that's relationship, job, or, or just indeed a, a social group where you feel knitted, if you feel knitted into a, a friend group, uh, or, or multiple, uh, multiple feelings of breaking in. Uh, that this, that's tends to happen a little bit younger than the locked-in crisis, which starts with feeling stuck or trapped in a career, a relationship, or a lifestyle that frustrates. And um, there's a lack of belief that you can actually get out of it, so you feel fundamentally trapped and locked in. And the resolution is breaking out, uh, of that, and then developing a sense of autonomous commitment in something new. Uh, so, so what I would say is that if, if, as, as a young adult, you're, you're struggling to balance independence and commitment. You kind of come out of your adolescence valuing independence enormously and the hard-won freedoms that you've cultivated to a degree. Uh, and then you have to give that up to a degree. And if, and, but if you get stuck too independent, you get isolated, and that's what happens up here. And if you get into a commitment but feel like you're stuck in it and you lose your boundaries, then you become engulfed uh, by it. And that, I think, is the essence of the locked-in crisis, is the feeling of feeling like of, of, of that you're in, engulfed by your situation. Now, uh, I, there, there, each of these kinds of crises has a particular phase structure, which tends to be pretty invariant. It kind of comes in a a million different ways, but with the same basic process to it. Uh, and this, this is a, a, a literally a screenshot from a recent guide that I produced with the bank First Direct, who are very interested in this phenomenon. Uh, and you can see the four phases of the locked-in type and the four phases of the locked-out type. So I'll just read, I'll just read them through th th to you briefly. So the locked-in type, you feel locked into at least one major commitment, usually relationship or job, that is found, despite expectations to the contrary, to be dissatisfying and stultifying. Separation and breaking out, you finally break the status quo. This is challenging and emotional time. <coughs> Try new things, you take time out to experiment, to explore what other options are out there, to gain perspective on life and your future options. And then resolution, sense of growth, you feel like you're no longer in the episode and are able to see what you've discovered about yourself during the period and how you've grown or changed from it. Now, that whole process, in my view, takes at least a year and, and, and often more. Uh, often people reflect that there, there's been potentially a, a period which has been a time of almost overwhelming emotion with a sort of wave either side that, that spreads out. Now, the locked out type, you find the young person often describing, uh, or I found them describing, very active, they're quite fired up, you know, active attempts to get a job or relationship or other valued social role. And that, you know, that just as they were told in all those motivational classes that if you want it enough, you'll get it. They just think, well, you know, I want it a lot, so I'll get it, right? Uh, no. So, I mean, I do think that we kind of, we sell some platitudes to young adults about, you know, what's, what's appropriate and valuable. That it's often quite one-sided and often lacking a sort of sense of realism sometimes. Um, and the t and, and, and that, that kind of thing, which is that, you know, what, if, if, is that, uh, which, which you know, you do hear a lot through university, you know, and I'm aware that we kind of say to, to, to students often, you know, that there's wonderful graduate roles out there for you all. You know, you'll, you'll leave university and with, the, you know, with, with, the, with the right degree and the right CV, you know, it'll, it'll all be yours. Um, but I've been, I'm very aware, because I've done research with graduates, that the year after leaving university is rough and tumble for a lot of people, you know, for a good, I would say 30 to 50% of graduates, that is a tough, year of compromise, of sort of gritty effort, of rescaling your goals down. And that's a lot of what you see in the locked out crisis. And I'll give you some examples, actually, from a study of graduates, a lot of whom were in a locked out experience. 
So locked out, they go through repeated failures to achieve the goal, barriers that won't come down, and then a gradual sort of crush to self-esteem, followed by a reflective pause, where you pause in your repeated attempts in order to try and find out alternative approaches to reaching your goal, and new ways of understanding yourself, and maybe rescale your goals. And in the end, that often typically is the case. So rescaling, you take a new approach, alter the nature and scale of the goal you're trying to achieve, and the eventual resolution brings a new and improved perspective on life. Now, um, that's, you know, the, the new and improved version is when a crisis is moved through well, in the sense that active changes are made that lead to growth, but that's not always the case. So that's the kind of, you know, that, that putting that as the end point is the end point, you know, in, in, in a positive spin. By the way, so what you're looking at there is, uh, is the archetypal structure of quarter life crisis, but many of those features will, will, will appear in crises in later age groups as well, in midlife and in later life. So by no means are these exclusive to quarter life crisis, but they just define the nuts and bolts of what the, de the developmental stage that these young adults are going through, this struggle between independence and commitment. So our next uh, slide is, have you had one? So I'm asking, have you had a, a, a quarter life crisis? So we're going to go for a locked in crisis or a locked out crisis, both or neither. You, so you, can, you should be able to select multiple here between the ages of 20 and 30. If you're currently between those ages, that's fine. Just refer to your life thus far. If you're over it, um, then that's fine too. But again, I want you to endorse this if you feel that you went through you know, a really profoundly challenging and transformative episode that fits one of those patterns. All right, well, the data's still coming in. So, but locked in and locked out, almost the same prevalence. Um, both well ahead of neither. Um, so, certainly we can say of you lot again that that first decade of adult life is one which is normatively troubling. You know, there are, again, there'll be periods of, uh, of, of, of which are awesome, but periods which are really. Uh, Really difficult. Now, I think crisis is particularly difficult if you've no sense that when you're passing through one, you're doing something that has a kind of normative quality to it, that other people experience and that's appropriate to what, to, to what you're experiencing. And, I, and I've no doubt that if someone had given me information about quarter life crisis when I was going through one, and, and I literally would have just checked off pretty much the whole list of kind of popular features of the locked in crisis. I mean, it was, uh, it would have, I think it would have given me sense that I was moving through something that was. Uh, no, that had a kind of uh, a quality to it that, 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 that linked me to other people uh, and that clearly had you know, a way out. In the end, as most people do, I got out of it, moved through it haphazardly. And by the way, when a crisis resolves, it very rarely resolves in full. And when I mean that, I, I mean that you know, whatever inner fragilities are there in a crisis. Whatever things come to the surface about you uh, and uh, your emotions, uh, when you pass out the, the, the end of the crisis, it's not like that you've fixed everything internally. You just have sufficient stability to move on to wherever you're going next. So while I would say having a quarter life crisis makes it less likely to have a really difficult midlife crisis, because you've kind of already done some important developmental work through that phase, it, it by no means precludes it, uh, because well, there's just a whole, you know, whole bunch of new stuff to it that appears at midlife. Uh, and I'm aware that we're going to have a five-minute break fairly soon and that it's quite warm in here. Um, so uh, I think we'll do a few more slides and then, and then break. Um, so here's some example quotes from a recent study of graduates talking about locked-out crisis, which is you know, quite similar to the kind of things that appeared on the board from some people earlier on. The fear of the unknown, everything before leaving uni was set out, and, and once I left uni, I became really worried and stressed at the thought of having to make decisions about the next stage of my life and where 
it was going to go. Uh, I struggled to find a secure job, either relating to what I studied or otherwise. I started questioning what the point in life was. There's a questioning component of crisis. Everything's open to question, including what's the point. Uh, and wondering how I even managed to get a degree in something my employers appeared to think I was no good in. Um, my partner left for university as well, which left me feeling very alone, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And then this, at the end is this kind of sense of, am I ever going to be independent, which is, which is important. Uh, as you can see here, that events happen which lead to a, a kind of crush or, or a decline in self-esteem and self-efficacy. Something wrong with me, I'm not good enough. And then again, rejection after rejection can be very, very challenging when you're going through that, that process of applying for jobs and almost by, you know, with, except for the very lucky few, there will be repeated rejections. And for a young person who's still building their self-esteem, that can be hard. Now, here's just a suggestion, which is if you'd like to hear some personal stories of quarter life crisis, go to this radio show that was recorded back, I think, in 2010, um, which is still on the BBC, probably because people listen to it so much still, I think. It, it features extracts from me, because they interviewed me about it, as well as three young people going through a quarter life crisis. And what you can do is listen to it and ask yourself, are the examples that I'm hearing examples of locked-in crisis or locked-out crisis? So you can kind of match the story to the pattern as they go. Now, if you've taken a picture of the screen, great. If not, I know that Niall's happy to send out slides afterwards. Um, right, now, before you read those quotes, let me just describe to you what's up there. So, a, a key inner dynamic, so the outer stuff we just talked about, the locked in and locked out processes, but a key inner dynamic to quarter life crisis is, is the struggle for authenticity and how can I be myself in a world that seems to suggest that I have to fake it to make it. Uh, when, uh, so you get this kind of double bind that young adults find themselves in where they're told to be themselves, but they're also told to play the game, to, to play the game which is to carefully curate your persona, whether it's via LinkedIn or via Facebook or just to other people in conversation to make sure that you seem okay. Uh, so it's the struggle with conformism. And I'll give you, these are some quotes from my, my study where the people were talking about this. This was a, a young man who was a, a lawyer. He was saying it was conformism. To be really good and to advance, you have to submit. You absolutely have to submit to the ways of doing things, the dress code and so on. It's military almost. You have to be, in a sense, an obedient soldier to progress up the ranks. Nobody tells you that you have to, and you could deviate and people get away with deviations, if you could if you get your hair cut in a certain way and wear your clothes in a certain way, that's the standard. So I felt fake because I felt I'm having to conform and had a conception of being a non-conformist. And there was this huge dichotomy between what I was doing and what I was in my head. And I've lost count of the times that people have described that same scenario to me in different ways, of feeling like there's this discrepancy between who they are inwardly and their life outwardly. So it's a very, very common pattern in quarter life crisis. Uh, and there's a young woman describing how she was, a her resolution to crisis, at the, how, how a crisis, her sense of going through one ended up in a good way. There was a sense of growth at the end. And she says, I realized that I could, do, I could do with these things. There was this achievement. So yes, I was like discovering a new part of me. I was thinking, wow, I can do this. I can do that. I can do whatever I want. I don't have things controlling me and myself, stopping me from doing these things. Now I give a harmonious aspect of myself, to which I said, that's interesting, what do you mean? Probably what I feel inside is showing outside. So there's a harmony within and without. So you can see the difference and how that, between someone saying how they felt before and how they felt after, there's a sense of discrepancy between inner and outer, which is resolved in some way. But I, I wanted to mention this other quote as well, because I think this, this, this is really important. Would you call yourself self-confident? No, definitely not. I think I can put on a good show, but that's just playing. You can pretend that you are okay. I guess that's what we all do a lot of the time. Fake it till you make it. And I think that phrase to me captures the paradox of being a young adult hugely in that they're aware of being pulled in two directions at once and they find that very difficult to reconcile. How to be yourself in a world which seems to suggest that authenticity is an unadulterated good, that it's authentic people who do well, but seeing that actually the requirement for impression management, for gameplay, for selective self-disclosure, for not saying weird things to people, that, you know, that, that to kind of re re retaining in a lot of information unless you know, you're stuck with your therapist or a partner or someone you can really trust, 
is the norm. And so what you see in quarter life crisis is not so much of people starting off inauthentic and coming out authentic. It's more having really fully engaged with the fact that there's a sort of paradox in life. That you have to live with that, and there isn't a neat resolution. That when you go to work, you have to be—you know—you you, you can't be exactly the person you are when you're spilling your guts to your therapist or coach or your uh, best friend. Uh, and we, we, in quantitatively, we see this as well, by the way. So we, we found in a study that people who were reported definitely being in a crisis, maybe being in a crisis or not being in a crisis, that their self-reported authenticity was lower in the people going through a crisis than those who weren't. And that makes sense because that is, seems to be such a defining feature of quarter life crisis, the struggle with authenticity and this sense of starting off feeling fake. A uh, recent study on quarter life crisis by some people at the University of Edinburgh using some of my, uh, my work and building on it was uh, social media and quarter life crisis. Uh, and this is be my last slide before we break give you a few quotes from this. Do you use Facebook more or less when you're experiencing negative emotions? If I am down, like properly, I don't go on Facebook. It's such a difference between how I feel and what's there. I think at the time, I don't need to see any of these fake happy people being successful. And I'm like, I'm already down. I don't need any more people to make me feel worse. Just so. Do you think social media contributes to your negative feelings, your anxiety and, and depression? A lot, smiling. It's this peer pressure, because you see people, because they filter what they post. They do not post routine, uh, they do not post routine like, hey, I woke up too late, my day was completely unproductive. They just don't do that. They just post the filtered or perfected versions of themselves, and you feel, oh my God, I'm doing so little, I'm so behind. But, uh, do you feel that social media contributes to your problem of negative self-comparison? Of course. You're bombarded by these successful people one way or another, and if it's not your friend who is a successful person, then he'll share an article about someone else who is a successful person, who is this good-looking person who's just started out a company at the age of 21 and is now a billionaire. <laughs> and so, so what I... This was interesting, because I, I hadn't actually personally done a study on social media and quarter-life crisis, but I'd had a lot of young people approach me and say, do you think that social media feeds this? Is, is, there, is it a problem that young people are, are struggling with? And I said... Well, you know, I don't have the data on it, but this, this study suggests, it's relatively small, but it suggests that, it, that it's kind of amplified this struggle that's always been there, that young adults have been facing, the struggle for authenticity, but it's created this kind of extraordinary, constantly manicured, constantly accessible uh, kind of persona system where, uh, 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 where, the, where the discrepancy between inner and outer, I think, is, is amplified and particularly if you're still finding that sense of security in yourself, as young adults are, there's still a lot of development to do when you're passing through your 20s. Uh, clearly, it's, uh, you know, it, it is presenting a challenge. Precisely how it affects teenagers is an area of very active research. It's not an area that I've looked at, um, but that's, as I'm sure many of you are aware, if any of you have teenage children or have access or, or are aware of it otherwise, that it's a, a, a major, major concern too. Right. Well, thank you for your contributions. Uh, let's try and get some air in, in the uh, In the big quantitative study I did looking at crisis in different age groups, when we looked at um, crisis in young adults and we asked them, having had one of these, do you feel that you grew as a result? We asked them about four particular kinds of change. Becoming a stronger person, so feeling more resilient. Increasing self-esteem, quality of life increased, and generally making positive changes. And... Uh, what was interesting is that I initially started this research off doing interviews, speaking to lots of people within an interview-based context in all kinds of ways, about all kinds of experiences. But what came out of the interviews was that pretty much everybody had a positive resolution. And what I then realized well, after I'd done subsequent research is that when you do interviews, uh, you kind of self-select people who've got a happy ending. So people will come to you and tell you their story if they feel that, that's the, that, that the narrative that they have to, to tell has a general kind of uh, a, 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 a positive trajectory out of it because that's something that is fairly rewarding to come and speak to a researcher about. If you do a brief anonymous survey where there's less in, uh, investment and involvement, you get a different picture that, which is more like the Chinese character of danger and opportunity. It's more of that double-edged sword quality. So this is uh, on those four dimensions where... Uh, did you become a stronger person? Did your self-esteem increase? Positive changes? You can see here that this 
part of the line represents people who broadly agreed or strongly agreed that, that there had been improvement. This is people who were ambiguous, said, I'm not sure, neither agree nor disagree. And this is people who disagreed. Now, what's important is that you can see quite quickly that broadly the majority of people felt that they'd experienced post-crisis growth, that this period of disintegration had led to positive outcomes, particularly for quality of life. Uh, and uh, we've got positive change there. Um, actually, the, unfortunately, the, this has been a slight quirk of the slide, that this doesn't perfectly relate to the four lines in terms of colour. But uh, the, the, the message is straightforward, which is that we've got an important minority of people who feel that there's post-crisis decline. So it's by no means inevitable that someone who goes through one of these experiences comes out the other side feeling like they've grown. It is a, uh, a time that is a, a time where fragilities can come out and problems can become that, that occur during it can become chronic. When we look to see of these items, which were the ones that was predicting resilience down the line, we found that in a, in a relatively small sample of young adults, where we looked at resilience and crisis experiences, so just going over to the, to the yellow here, we found that quarter-life crisis, post-crisis growth does predict becoming more resilient if you've, if you've experienced post-crisis growth, but particularly, and in fact only, whether someone had made positive changes. It was whether or not they'd, that, that someone had used the crisis to make tangible changes to their life was the predictor of whether or not they found that it made them more resilient over time. So it just shows that that is the key, is using crisis as an opportunity for exploring change rather than resisting it and staying the same. So it is a double-edged sword. And that double-edged nature feeds into our understanding of midlife crisis. Uh, I, I was, uh, we'll do your experiences of post-crisis change later on. I was going to do that via mentee, but I'm running a bit behind, so we're going to crack on, make sure I get through all the material I need to get through. Midlife crisis. Probably the most famous crisis, <laughs> the midlife crisis, culturally. People talk about it quite a lot, uh, often in a kind of pastiche way. If you Google... I often think there's quite an, an, interest, an interesting way of kind of getting a cultural, the, the getting, getting a sense of the cultural resonance of a concept is doing a Google Images search for it. <laughs> um, so if you do Google Images search for, for midlife crisis, you tend to find the kind of pastiche picture of, of, of men and motorbikes. <laughs> um, but uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna tell you that midlife crisis is actually uh, uh, by no means uh, a, a kind of something to, to, to uh, to, to, to laugh about in that it, it is a very profound fulcrum in the life journey and for many is very difficult. Now what, what midlife is, is it's a symbolic meeting point between opposites. So you are at the center point, you're neither one nor the other, you're neither young nor old but you're both. You'll, you'll experience still the, the, the kind of the um, uh, the, 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 the potency of, of youth but also the effects of aging. Powerfully, you'll experience, or uh, midlife has, has been said to be, and there's a variety of forms of research that support that it's uh, a, a part of life where you try to explore your contragender identity to some degree, or your 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 sense. If you're mass, your, your if you are a man, your sense of femininity. If you're a woman, your sense of masculinity, and exploring that sense of what does it mean to, to balance that out within myself and, uh, and move towards being potentially a more androgynous, less one-sided person. Uh, we'll come back to Carl Jung later on, uh, but he referred to this very explicitly in relation to midlife crisis and said it's, the, uh, it's the, the, the point in life where the animus, the masculine and the anima, the feminine, come into a kind of dialogue, but also into some kind of conflict as well. There's generativity and selfishness. Now, this is something that Eric Erickson, the famous developmental psychologist, referred to. He said, midlife is a time where you, you have to work out what is it that you're actually going to leave as a legacy beyond yourself. Young adulthood is quite self-focused, and that's adaptive. You're building your life. You have to focus your resources and your attention on yourself to make sure that you build it up to, 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 to a point where it's going to be sustainable. The midlife is, is, uh, is, you're starting to ask those big existential questions about is it actually, is human worth based more on what we give than what we receive, despite what we get told every day to the contrary? And productivity and decline, which obviously is very related to 
being young and old, but you know, we actually saw on the screen earlier on someone's experience of crisis, they just put one word, which was menopause. <laughs> and you know, menopause is a profound experience of being no longer biologically productive. You, know, you can't produce in that very meaningful sense of the word. And obviously that's a very tangible experience of going, moving between productivity and post-productivity, if you like. Uh, but equally, uh, f for many men who, who, whose midlife crises revolve around being utterly consumed by work, they'll be asking the question, is this, is this being productive? And they're waking, every waking minute being consumed by this job stress? So this is, uh, this is the, the essence of midlife crisis, it's a sort of collision of opposites, sort of bashed around. Um, this is a, another set of tables showing the most common features of the list I gave to the young adults as well. Men, you can, actually we've got the, the most prevalent ones at the top of this table, least prevalent at the bottom, at least in the top, is the top six for both men and women. And the reason I put this one in pink is because the prevalence was so much higher than the rest. For men, job, stress, pressure, was out there on its own as 41%. So interesting that for women, bereavement was the number one because uh, some of the very earliest theories of midlife crisis said that bereavement, often of a parent, is absolutely essential to understanding midlife crisis. But again, that's something that's been sort of lost to history to a degree. It's a guy called Jacques who wrote about midlife crisis and said that fundamentally it's actually a crisis of mortality as you start to realise that you've got less left than you've had you kind of you pass the halfway point you're kind of on the downward slope looking in looking into the abyss <laughs> debt feeling trapped divorce current peak age of divorce in the uk is 42 i'm uh 41 so. <laughs> should get through it uh so a divorce, obviously, is, is, a, is, a, is a, you can refer to it as a discrete life, life episode, but for everyone who goes through it, it is a crisis episode. It's almost impossible to pass through a divorce without experiencing an existential crisis alongside it as well. And uh, we can see that, obviously, on the, on, the, on the screen here, is that it came up for both men and women. Now, what I'm going to do briefly is to try, is, is just to point to something which is important and interesting. And something which I don't think is hugely widely discussed, and that's um, men uh, uh, in midlife. Because we, we, we did the study of lots of different age groups about crisis and post-crisis growth, and we asked them, how much do you feel you've grown out of your crisis? Uh, and then we mapped that sense of post-crisis growth against age and gender, and this is what we got. You see, the dotted line is males, and the, the, uh, the, the solid line is females. And that's just the mean amount of post-crisis growth. And, and we, we, we saw this, you know, it's a pronounced decrease in 40 to 40-year-old 40 men there. So we, we just ran the data in various ways. We kind of crossed items, looked at individual items, came out each way we did it. This dip in post-crisis growth in men in, uh, in, the, in, in that early 40s age range. Really interesting. And uh, so what that suggests is that um, men and women ha both have midlife crises, but men struggle to grow from them more than women. Now, although midlife crisis is very common, crises are very common, uh, I think that potentially we can make a link here because the, to, a, to a very unusual, very rare, but still very age-linked phenomenon, which is male suicide. Because if you plot suicide against age and gender in most developed countries, this is the UK, you get this. The purple line are the men, the female line is the orange, and the green line is the aggregate of the two. And you can see very clearly that in the UK, and indeed most affluent nations, you have a very pronounced peak of men in midlife committing suicide. Far more than women, about 400% more. Um, and uh, you do get this little secondary bump in very old men as well, but the numbers are smaller there in the sample, obviously, because a lot of people die around 80, uh, but this midlife peak, which peaks typically at 40, is very pronounced. 
Um, and, uh, you know, I, I don't know if you have, if this, if this resonates with you, but uh, personally, I know two people within the last 18 months who, between just after, you know, between the ages of 40 and 43, very apparently successful men who killed themselves. It's got to be talked about. So what could we learn about this in, ter in terms of a very common phenomenon like midlife crisis and what it might shine the light on in this very rare phenomenon, which thankfully is very rare, which is male, uh, male suicide in midlife. Um, and uh, I'm going to talk to you about the inner dynamics of midlife crisis now, which is, I think, one of the hardest parts of life's journey. And it's uh, what Jung referred to as the encounter with the shadow and the return of the repressed. So uh, this has been said since um, the early psychoanalysts were referring to it. Carl Jung uh, famously discussed this. Uh, that, so for, for Carl Jung was arguably the first lifespan development psychologist because he saw mental health as a, as a constantly evolving process over the course of the lifespan. And he saw the midlife crisis as this, as this crucial experience. He, he, saw, he said it was the return of the repressed and the end of the young adult persona. Uh, and what the return of the repressed means is that you just get too old to repress things. Repression requires energy, so does suppression. By the way, suppression is where you just don't say what's in your mind, but you know it's there. And repression is where it goes to the point where you've sort of forgotten it's there. You can't consciously articulate it anymore. There is no doubt that repression and suppression are a phenomena that almost everybody experiences to some degree and you can empirically show in a variety of ways. It's a very provable aspect of psychoanalysis. But the encounter in midlife crisis is, is, is with this idea of the shadow, which is all of yourself that you've put away up until midlife. And the direct realisation that you contain awful potential as well as awesome potential. And you can see in the diagram the return of the repressors, this kind of backward arrow out of the unconscious towards the conscious. Now, seeking help in this period is crucial if necessary because you'll start to experience some very strange and disconcerting inner phenomena. And that is going to rock you. And if you don't share it, it's going to create a, a substantial amount of inner instability. And men are bad at seeking help. Fact. Okay? And I could give you many studies that show that men are bad at seeking help. Women are much better seeking help as a general coping strategy at all age groups. So the book that I would recommend if you're interested in the midlife passage and the midlife crisis and these uh, very real and very powerful inner dynamics, which I think is a terrific short book with, full of wisdom, is called The Middle Passage for Misery to Meaning in Midlife by James Hollis. And I really believe that James Hollis is writing. So now, Hollis is a, is a, is a, is a therapist uh, and a sort of ex-academic turned therapist who, who, who writes with incredible articulacy about complex developmental phenomena. And, uh, and this book has, I think, received over 100 five-star reviews on, on Amazon, and I understand why. So here's some quotes from the book. <clears throat> the shadow represents the wounding of one's nature in the interest of collective social values. Such an interesting phrase, that. And what he means by that is that in order to adhere to collective social values, you put away parts of yourself that you think or you've been told are inappropriate for a social context. That starts when you're tiny, when your parents tell you not to do things because they're inappropriate and it carries on all the way through. So it's the wounding of yourself in the interest of the collective. By midlife, one has managed to repress large portions of one's personality. Anger, for example, frequently erupts during the middle passage because one's been encouraged to suppress it. Other shadow encounters are also painful as one is obliged to acknowledge a continuing catalogue of emotions not normally acceptable to the persona world, such as selfishness, dependency, lust, and jealousy. Now, if you hear about that in the abstract, it's all very well, but to feel that viscerally yourself, that all this lies within you and it's unacknowledged and messy, it's very, very difficult. Here's another quote from the book. The shadow should not be equated with evil, only with life that has been suppressed. As such, the shadow is rich in potential, crucially for today. A conscious appointment with the shadow at midlife is essential, for it will be operating surreptitiously in any case. We must examine what we envy or dislike in others and acknowledge those very things in ourselves. This helps to prevent our blaming or envying others for what we have not done ourselves, and it encourages to recognize that only a small part of our potential has been tapped, and that we are often overly smug, overly secure in our ego achievements. It reveals other sources of energy, creativity, and personal development. And otherwise, you need to face up 
to all of this difficulty and suppressed darkness within yourself if you're also going to open up to all the untapped light that exists within you as well. So that's why I think the midlife crisis is difficult. I think that's why men find it so difficult to grow from it because you have to talk about it. You have to seek help. You have to find ways of bringing all this inwardly hidden material into your outer life to some degree. You'll be terrified initially, so many people will, and that's, you know, that's, what, that's kind of the process of psychotherapists in the audience, you know, this is kind of your life, is that you, you sit with people day in, day out, who initially come to you terrified about what they might disclose, and as they disclose it, they gradually realise, oh, there's much less here to be terrified than I thought, it's just that it's been in my, rotting in my locked cupboard for so long, that it's kind of all got a bit stinky. Uh, and that's kind of the analogy, really, is that if you, if, you know, if you put a piece of food in a cupboard and lock it, then, you know, and you keep it locked, you, won't, you don't have to smell it. <laughs> but as soon as, as soon as you open it, or as soon as age starts to open it, then, and the stink comes out, you realise you've really got to f deal with a, the with a rotting food. Um, and the same is true of anything else that's, uh, that's part of your inner life. So, uh, so yes, short book, easy to read, lots to learn. Um, Hollis has a lot to talk about in terms of, by the way, just before we move on, uh, as well as divorce, uh, Hollis has a lot to say about affairs as part of the midlife passage. He points to research showing that, so by the way, the divorce rate in the UK is about, so about 40, just over 40% of marriages end in divorce at the moment in the UK, and about 50% of people have affairs. Sorry. Uh, according, according to, you know, according to re respectable data. So you have to understand this is normative psychological phenomena, behavioral phenomena that needs to be understood. And divorce peaks in midlife, guess what? So do affairs. So anyway, so that's, that's where, you know, you need to understand. And so Hollis understands the, the affair as trying to recapture some of your lost or hidden sense of self by bringing in another who feel represents that. Now, he also says, you know, you may find your soulmate by having an affair, you know, cool, you know, but for a lot of people, it's just, you know, it ends up in just, you know, a whole world of pain. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I, as, as someone who's 41 and not having an affair, <laughs> I'm observing some of my friends around me, one of whom has recently had an affair and is, and, and, and is dealing with pretty much an archetypal, extremely challenging, emotionally, absolutely up to his eyeballs midlife crisis. Um, so it's, you know, it's... Uh, it's something that I'm sure many of you have observed as well, because, you know, because it surrounds us. You know, it's, it's kind of this invisible everywhere-ness, you know, all this stuff. Do you remember when uh, Ashley Madison got hacked, the, the affairs website? One website that organizes affairs, people. Its tagline is, life is short, have an affair. <laughs> they, so Ashley Madison had one million UK members. Get your head around that. One affairs website. Yes. This, folks, is the kind of stuff that you keep, or people keep, under the surface, and which comes back, smacks you around the face at some point. Later life crisis. Now, I did a piece, a piece of research back in 2014 with a colleague, Alex Stell, about what it means to have a crisis in your 60s. And... Um, we, we did, it was an interview-based study. This is, this is the list of people we spoke to. You can see they're from all around the UK. Quite middle class, but, you know, a variety of professions uh, and people talking about crises that happened that sort of modally around the age of 60. Whoop. And uh, we, I gen we genuinely had no idea what would come up. It was properly, proper exploratory research. We, you know, we sort of said, we'd like to speak to you if you feel you've had a transformative major personal crisis around this age group. Um... <coughs> And we, I don't, we, we, neither of us were prepared for quite how challenging the interviews were going to be and the kind of stories we had to listen or we, we, we sat through. And the stories were broadly about how you manage the reality of loss when it hits. And when we mean loss, that was, there were all kinds of ways that people were referring to this sense of how you actually deal with this realisation that things just gradually get stripped away. Loss of meaning, loss of friend groups, loss of work loss of a partner, a bereavement, loss of health, loss of mobility, all kinds of losses which people were trying to work through 
in this kind of transformative sense of like, I'm trying to work out how, how I build from here. So, so every single person within their story experienced two or more substantial losses in a short period of time. And what became very clear to us is that later life crisis is very much about acclimatizing to the proximity uh, of mortality. Mortality is there in every crisis. You'll find in quarter life crisis, people start to kind of just ruminate about death and stuff just randomly because when you're in a, a kind of ending experience where you're kind of leaving something behind and going to the next thing, uh, mortality tends to come up anyway, but it's just right up there in later life crisis as kind of one of the key, key components. So, and we, we put together this model where we, so we said, so people at this age experience the challenges of coping with more than one loss-inducing stressful life event, illness, bereavement, retirement, divorce, residence, move, care of a parent or spouse, uh, and where, where we'd hear, hear things like, all sorts of things like, you know, we, I retired and we, so we, me and wife said, hey, let's move to Portugal and I'll get a villa. And then they both just got incredibly depressed because they left all their friends behind and they felt this nagging sense of loss. So, uh, you know, all kinds of ways that the sense of sort of, 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 of loss manifested. And loss linked depressive emotions and cognitions that were kind of about trying to process this sense of loss. But then comes the kind of the tangible work of crisis. So that as the person engages firstly between the, their activity, how much do I step back and become uh, and accept a certain amount of disengagement, just sort of you know, sit in the deck chair and watch the clouds go by? Or how much do I force myself back into productive roles and kind of make myself someone again? So a struggle between engagement and re-engagement and uh, a struggle between ego integrity and despair, which again, Erickson, Eric Erickson said was defining of this age group. Ego integrity is broad, can be broadly defined as acceptance of the past, acceptance of the present, and acceptance of the future. In other words, not having too many regrets, basically being okay with where you are uh, and not feeling too bad about the prospect of age-related decline and death. It's, it's a big job, you know, getting, getting there. That's a lot of acceptance to process. And you don't necessarily want to accept everything because there's some things that might not be acceptable in your life. So, you know, it is about a struggle between the sense of acceptance but the sense of fight and the sense of slight despair. Uh, and... Uh, In the context of a later life crisis, feeling loss-linked depressive emotions and cognitions may be adaptive. They may be part of the process. It might not simply be they should be medicated away, but they may be part and parcel of a sort of letting go. I just brought, pulled out some quotes from this uh, study for you to, again bring, to bring these abstract ideas to life. So you're having to face your own mortality in a way. You think you're invincible when you're younger and then suddenly, bang, your body's letting your mind and then things you want to you suddenly find that you can't do because your body's wear and tear. There's wear and tear on your body that you hadn't realised. You've got to cope with it. So, and Jane was really reflecting on the fact there that, you know, that, that, uh, that her health hadn't, wasn't what she had, what she would wish and she'd retired and had kind of envisaged her retirement as sort of glossy retirement magazines of sort of champagne and cruises but it was really quite restricting and she was really feeling quite hemmed in. This was Ted, I can't get a job or a part-time job or something. Well, I can, but not the sort of thing I wanted. I do have the irritation that people knew me. Here, nobody knows what I can do and it's very hard to get in somewhere. So he'd moved to a different part of the country to be close to his kids in his retirement, left his friends behind uh, and then found that he kind of was just sort of a floating, a sense of floating and not really having any purpose or roots. So Belinda saying, I think the problem that I feel I've made a lot of mistakes in, in my life, and when you're older, when you're over 60, you tend to go back over those mistakes, and they really do affect you then. Um, I think she's right. I think, again, we tend to ruminate on, on the past to ver at varying points throughout life, but I think that retrospection is something that becomes quite key to well-being in later life. People tend to think back a lot. There's less to look forward to. The past becomes a key area to feel good about. Uh, Paula, she, uh, she really wanted to not work. She said, it's been a pretty grim ride ever since I've been down here. She moved down to Cornwall because I haven't been able to find the sort of work that I enjoy and it's been sheer grit and bones and dust slog. I've had to work all the hours God made to make a living. So for her, it was this sort of struggle between I actually really want to disengage, but I can't because I don't have enough money to retire. So still there's engagement, disengagement, struggle with it, but in a different direction. 
And Barbara saying, I couldn't go to work anymore. I still managed to do some volunteering, very much scaled down. I felt I couldn't continue to do all the things I enjoy doing. This meant I wasn't seeing the people I used to see, people that I know and had the opportunity to chat and catch up with. I was becoming more isolated. And that sense of isolation, again, being uh, something that's important because it's about, again, the extent to which one accepts the fact that life, as it constricts, with age, you know, as you become less mobile or less able to do all the things you once did, you'll see fewer people. Um, what I've not done is research on crisis that relates to uh, the transition in elderly life, uh, which is referred to in a variety of ways, but what's sometimes called the fourth age transition, which is where the person transitions from being no longer fundamentally independent. So there, it's, 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 a, it's, it's, it's often, there's often a moment where, where people can actually point to that was when I no longer could be an independent person. I needed care. I needed to move into a supported environment. I needed meals on wheels, whatever it might be, where, or, I, or I got my driving license taken away, which, you know, happened to my granny, I'm sure people. So it's that point in, in, eld, in elderly life where, where suddenly you're, you're, you realise that independent living is no longer a full option anymore. And, de and growing dependency is, is the pattern from that, that point on. I think there's a good argument to suggest that, that could, that's potentially one of the most psychologically challenging transitions in the whole lifespan. It would be a fascinating study to look at narratives of exactly how people cope with that. People who, you know, who, who still are, uh, who don't have dementia and can, and can convey interesting experiences about it. One study I did do was of people who moved into a retirement village. And for those of you who know, a retirement village is, is, is a kind of curated space where you have a sort of supported apartment or house and care on tap, you know, and, and meals made for you. It's like a kind of hotel for elderly people, you know, it helps have a bit of money. But there's lots of versions of it out there. But essentially, once you're in, you live in a world where it's just people over the age of 80, really. Retirement village is, is a euphemism, really. You don't, you don't move there when you retire. Uh, you move there when you're not independent anymore, but not fully you know, in need of a, a nursing home or a care home. And people would tell me such, such interesting stories about their experience of trying to adapt to life in a retirement village, um, which broadly kind of, it wasn't explicitly about crisis, but it was people describing how they were trying to adapt at this most challenging of period of life. Um, so what I think is that, I think there's a very strong argument for saying that if you're providing support to someone who is experiencing difficult emotions in the context of a later life crisis, they need really quite different kinds of help and support than someone who's experiencing the same kind of emotions but within the context of a midlife or early adult crisis. All of these concepts overlap and the kinds of phenomena that occur in them overlap. You may have shadow work to do in later life crisis if it hasn't been something that's been addressed yet. But I, I think that it's important to recognise that you know, the unique challenges of these different parts of life. So in very brief summary, just as a kind of take home, distill it down, Quarter life crisis is a crisis of breaking into adult life and social roles, you're feeling locked in and locked out of those, and the inner side being seeking authenticity and managing your persona. Midlife crisis is the pressure cooker of multiple roles and the danger of burnout, the inner side of which is the return of the repressed and the encounter with a shadow. And later life crisis is the crisis of moving out of productive adult life roles and feeling that deep sense of loss, and of the empty nest, and of no longer being recognized at work, and the search for ego integrity in an encounter with mortality. And just bear in mind that all of those kind of interweave and overlap and kind of shade into each other. So the... F <laughs> Jolly stuff. Um, well, you know, I think that... We, I think we have a kind of problem in society, which is what I would call phobophobia. It's kind of fear of fear. You know, it's, if, 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 you, if you're afraid of all of this stuff, as well as experiencing it, then it kind of compounds the problem. It, 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 the, the, the starting point is to accept that it's all there, it's all real, and that, 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 that a standard adult life is a really rocky road, um, and that that's cool, in a way. It's, it's exciting. But that's a good starting point. You know, I think that the lifespan perspective to understanding the, the ups and downs of, uh, of life is, uh, is, is, a, is an empowering one. So, uh, and on that point, what's the function of crisis episodes in development? So, what, so why are they so prevalent? You know, there's so many of them. Are they just 
an annoying anomaly or is there a point? Well, obviously, over the course of what I've been describing, there's implicitly saying that there's, you know, the, the, these have a kind of a role to play in different life stages, but I'll just distill it down with, this, with some final slides and a, and, a, and a quick study that I did. So, so my answer is that crisis episodes bring distress and positive disintegration as a powerful motive for change and an openness to new ideas and new ways of coping that can bring, but not definitely will, creative solutions within and without. And that is where the potential is released. Because there's lots of new stuff done in crisis, which is not done in the relatively routine process of when life is in a stable phase. Because the message that being happy gives you is carry on doing the same. Okay, that's what, if you're happy with something, the happiness just is, is, like, is your way of, of, of sort of inwardly knowing that you have to continue it. So great, feeling happy is great, but, it, it, but, but its message is continuity. Um, and the, the disruptive emotions, the messages change. Um, Tony Robbins, a uh, famous uh, uh, motivational speaker, got it quite right. And he said, there is no breakthrough without a breakdown. It's a cliche, but it's true. And structurally, it's true. You need to break down the stru a structure of a life in order to build a new one. You know, there's, we are structural beings. You know, we, we have bodies, but we have mind structures and we, life structures and lifestyles which hold us in place like cobwebs. You know, we're kind of stuck in them sometimes and you've really got to rip them apart to get the next one in place. Uh, and a neat book is called Positive Disintegration by someone called Dabrowski who talked about what I'm telling you now, really, which is how as you pass through adult life, you pass through periods of disintegration, fragmentation. And that's cool, that's positive, precisely because it's a prelude to a new level of integration. And that there's no one without the other. So I did a study where I predicted uh, specifically that people in crisis would be more curious about themselves and the world than other people. Um, precisely because of what I've just told you, that, you know, that, that, that crisis is uh, about being open to new stuff. And that's what curiosity is. Uh, there's actually a book written called Curiosity, which opens with a description of someone in, in a midlife crisis who, who describes how that was the genesis of a, new, of, of, of a really important insight that would only have come, out, come about because of the curiosity that the crisis engendered. All sorts of reading they were doing to try and make sense of their messy life, and what came out was a really big thing. So I, so I, I, I got a, did a study where we got lots of people again, big, big sample, about over 1,000 people in this one, and we looked to see would we find that people in crisis are more curious than people who aren't about themselves, the world, other people? In a sense, this is slightly contra to what many psychologists would say, because there's, there's one view that psychologists hold, which is called broaden and build theory, which says that it's when you're happy and positive that you tend to explore, uh, and when you're sort of feeling down, that you tend to kind of just collapse. So in a sense, if we did find you know, this kind of elevated curiosity, it would be an interesting thing. So we checked. We got various curiosity measures. So perceptual curiosity, which is curiosity in what you can see. Uh, the, this one, which is about curiosity about knowledge, curiosity about people, curiosity about yourself. And uh, we did this quasi-experimental design where we compared people who are of a, of a particular age range who were and weren't in a crisis. And then simply, so then the graphs you're about to see are people who are and aren't in crisis across three age ranges, young adults, midlifers, and older adults. Um, yeah. And I'm, I'm aware that you know, we're, we're uh, running relatively close to completion in terms of time-wise, so I'll go through this quickly. So, that's, so the, 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 the solid line is people in crisis. So you can see early adulthood, midlife, and later life, intrapersonal curiosity was higher in the crisis group. That's curiosity about yourself. Highest in the young adults, but higher in every age group in people who are describing in crisis. So that's intrapersonal. What about epistemic? Well, we've got a higher, that's higher in young adults and midlifers, but not in older adults. So that's curiosity about knowledge, higher in the crisis group. Uh, Interest-based curiosity we see higher in the crisis group, particularly in the young adults again. Just remember the solid lines crisis. Interpersonal, not a huge difference, but a little bit reliably higher in the crisis group in all age groups. And uh, finally, perceptual curiosity. That's curiosity in stimuli, what you can see here and stuff. And you see that, that, again, that's particularly, that's higher in every age group in the crisis group, but highest, there's the difference is highest, is biggest in the early adulthood group. 
Now, we did inferential statistics on that. Those, all of those differences in those ANOVAs proved significant, and we did point-by-point -point comparisons you can look at in the article. It supports our view that crisis is a time of elevated curiosity, and that's the silver lining. And if you use that, 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 that heightened curiosity, that search-based mentality, that questioning-based mentality, that something will come with it. Uh, we also, actually, in this study, asked about books. So we asked people what particular kinds of book you're interested in at the moment. Some interesting stuff came out of that. I'll give you that quite quickly. Uh, so we asked uh, about whether they're interested currently in reading, or whether they are currently reading and interested in science fiction, biography, history, self-help, spirituality and religion, science and nature, current affairs and politics, food and eating, art and architecture, or other. And if I had time, I'd, I'd get you to guess <laughs> which book genres are particularly popular in different age groups by crisis, but I'll just go straight to it. So early adult crisis is related to reading self-help and spirituality books, which is interesting. Hold the thought, because I'm going to tell you something on the next slide about that. Midlife crisis, self-help as well, but biography, which I thought was really interesting. So, and as in people who are in a midlife crisis compared with midlifers who aren't, read loads more biographies. So I thought that was interesting in that you're trying to understand your life journey, so you're trying to make sense of others. Now, biography, almost by definition, is crisis literature. I would argue that there's barely an autobiography ever written where there are no crises. Um, and if someone has lived such a life, then, and they do write an autobiography, no one will read it. So, and, and try, try me, you know, think about any biography or autobiography you're currently reading and how what makes it a dynamic read is people overcoming hard times, turning around crises, making it redemptive, etc. Uh, this is fascinating. Later Life Crisis was genuinely related to reading <laughs> about, honestly, food and eating. And I was like, what? So I kind of just, again, had to recheck my analyses. I was like, what's going on there? Just, all I can work out is that, you know, faced with the end, eat. That's all I can think of, you know, it's like, that just, that's, it's a kind of Epicurean solution. It's like, why not? I hopefully I'll get to replicate that piece of research and see if that comes back again, but we'll, we'll see. So I should say, by the way, so, 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 so I had a quarter life crisis. Yes, it was about a huge career change, relationship change, and many other things, residence change personality changed to a degree, but there was a, a, a something that was crucial for me was, uh, was, was, was that it was, it was a spiritual crisis as well. I kind of went off and did a meditation retreat in India and asked myself lots of deep questions and tried to make sense of life in a way that seemed to kind of be all, about exploring parts of myself that, were, that my intellect couldn't grasp, you know, something that was slightly beyond what, uh, what words and, uh, and, uh, and, and rationality can quite grasp. I said, and that set in train a process which led to uh, uh, me kind of exploring that more and more and seeing how it was an important, became an important part of my life um, and it acts as a complement to my academic work because academic work is quite drying, it's quite brainy uh, and quite uh, uh, wordy. You know, you're kind of processing huge quantities, millions upon millions of words every year and it can just dry you out. And so I find that certain activities that I now do um, which I would call spiritual practices, help me from not getting too desiccated and depressed by the, uh, you know, the difficulties of working in higher education. <laughs> now, the, the reason I'm mentioning this now is that I've just literally written a book. It's coming out in August called uh, Pass Between Head and Heart, Exploring the Harmonies of Science and Spirituality. Um, and uh, it's, it's not about institutional religion. It's about personal growth and about how if you embrace your inner scientist and your inner spiritual side, that you can create a kind of higher level uh, harmony. Um, if you'd like to come to the launch event, you're welcome. It's on July the 5th. Um, tickets are on my website, and uh, uh, yeah, it should be, should be fun. It's just not actually out until August, so it's like a pre-launch, but there will be books available at the event. But I kind of see that as a product of my quarter life crisis. <laughs> it took over 10 years to, to actually turn into some sort of tangible thing, a book. But there you go. That's, uh, that's, that's life. Sometimes, you know, the process of moving through stuff uh, takes a while. Um, now, I, I, I must say, I'm not done a huge amount of research on the kind of spiritual existential side of crisis episodes, but that's something I very much intend to go next. And I'm sure you'll be interested to hear that my next study, which is happening this summer, is on dreaming and crisis. So I'm going to be looking at how dreams 
whether or not dreams reflect back to people the crises they're experiencing and ever provide any insights to help them with the, the, their, their personal growth journey. Um, and I'm going to be working with a dream specialist at the University of East London on that, so uh, it's going to be fun. Um, I'll, uh, I'll try and, uh, when, when that's out, I'll try and put that out via Neil so that you get, you get, you get to hear about it and participate in it, if you like. Um, that's it. Any questions or comments? So we've got a bit of time. You mentioned the time, the shadow. Yeah. Could you speak a little more about that? About the shadow? Yeah. Sure. So the shadow is a, kind of, is a post-Jungian concept. Carl Jung originally coined it, but now many psychologists who work with some of Jung's vocab vocabulary use it, such as Hollis, such as myself. Uh, and it refers to the sum total of, of, of everything that you've, you've yet to fully express. Uh, 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 and that typically has been, well, and the reason that you haven't expressed it is because over time, from a young age all the way through your formative years and into adulthood, you've, not, you've, you've specifically not expressed it because you felt that it doesn't fit with what you perceive to be social expectations, whether that's your parental expectations, your school-based expectations, or what you broadly perceive as what society thinks is appropriate, whether that's some aspect of your sexuality, whether that's some aspect of your emotions, whether that's some aspect of yourself, like a fear that you're, you know, a sense of kind of potentially being uh, unpleasant or violent or something like that, which you've just squeezed out of your personality into a kind of hidden area. And so it's that that is the, sh the encounter with the shadow is simply the encounter with aspects of yourself that you've yet to embody. Yeah, I mean, uh, enormously positive. I mean, I, I want to emphasize that because every crisis is a mixture of danger and opportunity, and it's like a, a period of development and fast forward, it's an enormous opportunity for maturation and for growth. And, I, uh, and so, yes, it's hard, but try and flip out of the either or logic of something is bad or good, because a crisis is both. And that's what the Chinese character tries to represent, is that bo it's both good and bad simultaneously. It's both painful and an opportunity for growth. And sometimes you can be experiencing good and bad emotions almost at the same time. So you'll be feeling a sense of sort of awesome excitement and fear, you know, and, and holding that. So, so that's what I would try and, and convey. And that's true of every cri crisis in every age group. Um, and just reiterating again that when you're trying to rebuild yourself, the only way of doing that is by, re is, is by dismantling the previous structure to some degree. And that feels frightening. You can feel quite bare when you've kind of taken off all that structure. But again, that's, you know, that, that's hard and good at the same time. So uh, I'm actually giving a talk in August at the Positive Psychology Center at the University of Pennsylvania. So, uh, so I'm going to have to try and, <laughs> kind of, you know, try and convey that as much as I can. Because for those of you who know about positive psychology, it's quite happy, clappy psychology. It's like, yeah, just think of things and everything will be fine. You know? <laughs> just write a list of what you're grateful about and it'll be fine. Um, so and I think it kind of sets people up for a fall to some degree, because then when things go almost inevitably arse over tit at some point, you know, they kind of go, well, I've been doing, I've been doing my gratitude list. What's, what's happened? So it'll be interesting to see how they, how they take my message. But anyway. Uh, there's a hand up there, but the mic's gone over there. I think you probably answered, um, answered what I was going to say, it, what you just said. But on that positive element, I think it's really important to stress that that midlife can be just this fantastic trajectory, particularly for women who've given up their lives for people for the last 20 years. You know, it happened to me at 51, I went like that, I changed career. I did have an affair, one of those 40% in the last 10 years of women who are actually doing that. Um, Thanks for admitting it. <laughs> well, it's not for everybody, but it was massive and it can be, and it wasn't a problem, it wasn't a crisis, it was a rebirth, and it's really important to Well, if it was just a rebirth with no crisis, then, you know, all power to your arm. That suggests that, you know, you went through a, a period that had no pain attached and was just like, woohoo! <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> so that's great, but absolutely, a midlife is 
a really exciting period of life, just as every age range is. There's so much opportunity for discovery and rebirth in every age range. Um, but often it does take, you know, some, some big events, some big stuff, you know. Often it's not about just kind of carrying along in the routine that you've devised until then. It's about a certain amount of self-reinvention. Uh, so if you do that with no suffering attached, then officially you do it without a crisis, because a crisis almost by definition comes with a sense of overwhelming kind of, wow, you know, I can't I if I can handle all this. Um, uh, and, those, and those are real experiences too. People go through po transitions that are pretty much wholly positive. Um, still, I would tell you that transitions that are culturally kind of, you know, the, the above the line version is yay, you know, the kind of the, the transitions like getting married, which, you know, officially that should be entirely happy because it's like a happy thing, right? Getting married. But I would pitch to you that getting married is, <laughs> comes with <laughs> loss and gain and that everyone who gets married will feel excitement at the prospect of being with this person. But the fact is that all, this other, all these other opportunities are gone. You know, it's like you've, a thousand million other possibilities are just gone. And that, <laughs> can't, you can't do, do that without a sense of, of loss. So you have to accept you know, that, that any sort of major commitment, no matter how overtly happy, comes with little nagging undercurrents as well of sort of difficulty and loss. Uh, for me, every transition is a, is a mixture of loss and gain experiences. And you feel tend to feel sad about the past. If you lose something, you tend to feel anxious about the future. So that's why depression and anxiety co-occur so much, because they tend to occur around transitions, where you've got that mixture of sort of loss and stuff and fear about what's coming next. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, so, first of all, a big piece of my life has just fallen into place. I realised I had an early life crisis that led to a complete change of life direction. So, so thank you for that. Um, I now work as a sort of management consultant coach, and I'm always interested in practical applications. And the thought that's jumping out at me here is the potential power of making explicit to people going through crisis this cycle of it being an opportunity yep. for growth and potential. Absolutely. Um, have you done any work in that area? Are you aware of any? I, the, 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 what I'm aware of, uh, and this relates to the fact that you know, my, my, I'm most, the research I'm most known for is the quarter life crisis stuff, just because it's kind of, I've done more of it and it's kind of gained more popular traction. Uh, so I know a number of coaches who work specifically using the, the, the rubric of and the stages of quarter life crisis. Um, and also group based coach activities. There's, a, there's an organization called Mind the Gap Coaching that uses, um, it, looks, it works with young adults. Uh, to try and help them pass through the, the, the crises of, 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 of young adulthood. Um, uh, as a, an excellent female coach called Alice Stapleton, who works with Quarter Life Crisis, who, who work I recommend, and she and I have interacted quite a lot. Um, so certainly, uh, I've, I've produced a, a how-to guide for how to survive a Quarter Life Crisis, which um, is on my, on my, on my website. Um, so yes, absolutely. Now, in terms of helping people in, 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 who are kind of coaching through the later life phases, again, I think there's a huge amount of scope. And I think that in many ways, retirement co you know, coaches who specialise on people who are recently retired, almost by de facto, a large proportion of people who come to them will be in a later life crisis. Because if you've, if, you've if, you've, if you've retired and, and, you, and your health is good and your marriage is good and you're just looking forward to the future, you probably won't seek specialist help. But if, if, you, if you've retired and you feel that you've like lost this important part of yourself and that you know, your life is fragile, you'll probably seek support. So I think that, yeah, that, that, that coaches who work with that age group as well you know, will work with people in crisis to a large degree. And you, you, you mentioned just then that the, that, that quarter life crisis model is used at that stage. Is the model different in midlife and later life? Yes. It is. Um, so, I mean, I had, the, I had the model of later life crisis up there. So, so that is really different from quarter life crisis. Very, very different phenomenon. And midlife too. Um, again, I would point, because I, I'm, I feel like it's kind of the job's done, I would point towards Hollis's work on midlife crisis as an excellent map for navigating the midlife passage. Perfect. Perhaps. Look forward to it. Um, so men are less likely to look for help. 
Correct. On average, yes. Yeah, that's an interesting point. So it's true that, yes, that, that, so what I read a piece of research that shows that men benefit from em, emotion-focused therapy rather than solution-focused therapy precisely because they're, they're naturally solution-focused anyway. And so it's when they focus on their emotions that they tend to get more benefit, whereas actually you find the opposite in women. Now, that was an interesting gender study that I read about the benefits of, of kind of counselling intervention. Um, I mean, there are, you know, I, 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 what I won't do is open up the huge can of worms about all the, the many complex reasons behind male suicide, because there are many about, you know, for example, women try as much as men. So parasuicide is as common in, 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 in women as men. Um, so, but there's, there, so some people just think that men are, you know, are use, use more effective methods, <laughs> if you like, if, you, if, the, if the effective is the right word. <laughs> more we, uh, methods that are more likely to end up with you know, what they set out to do. So I think there's that. But I, 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 for me, still, I think, you know, this, just, just to, to fit it into the narrative of today, you know, one crucial thing is, is, is the male shadow and how that often involves anger and violence because that's crucial to, to, to the masculine disposition to some degree. Hence, outlets for aggression have been required for men and women across the ages. But how there are very few cultural outlets for that nowadays. And so it can turn into quite a nasty shadow if it, if it just remains purely internalised for decades. And whether or not that comes out at midlife specifically is one thing, but um, people have found that something about that midlife crux that makes it tend to come up. So. Yes, thank you. Um, I've been working with techniques of mindfulness for the past 20 years. And one of the things I'm working with is being able to separate what you do from who you are. And the less I identify what I do with myself, the less I feel stressed about change. And I'm just wondering whether you've experienced of this and how by separating who we are, what yeah. we do from Very good point. Who we are. So I, what I would say is that in all quarter life, midlife and later life crisis, that is a, is a live issue. Because what young people, uh, uh, young adults tend to feel in their crisis is, is, is that they're, they're learning to understand about how to define themselves irrespective of the roles they're in. So it's not that I am a, and then that defines me. It's that I have total intrinsic value irrespective of the job that I do and of the people who are kind of defining me from the outside and trying to find that sort of, you know, that, 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 that sense of, of self beyond role. And then that again becomes live in midlife crisis again as you start to, you know, under the weight of midlife pressure. And, even, and then profoundly a later life, where you have to learn to exist to a degree without roles. So I think that that, that, that is a kind of a recurring sort of cyclical feature. So I would, so, and, and I do think that mindfulness plays an important, potentially prof profound important role in all crises, precisely because it gives you some distance from your, your own experiences and, and the life events. Thank you. No worries. Um, and, uh, Well, I don't want to eat into the break because it's important to have a good sized break before the next speaker because yep. you guys have got a lot to di digest cognitively okay. today. But if anyone wants to come and ask me, thank you very much.